one. Welcome everyone to the lecture Gender and Resilience in a Coastal City, Stories of Equity and Sustainability from the Ground of the Cigar PH and NRC Lecture Series. This, this event is organized by the Coastal Cities Actors in the Philippines Investing in Climate and Disaster Resilience Project of the Atenea de Manila University and the National Resilience Council in partnership with the University of the Philippines in the Visayas and the Iloilo City local government. <clears throat> Our session today is broadcasted live on the Facebook pages of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines and the National Resilience Council. Please be guided by today's house rules. All attendees and participants are automatically muted upon entry. The ceremony will be recorded for documentation purposes. For panelists, uh, microphones and videos must only be used when necessary. For our attendees via Zoom, please send your questions through the chat box found at the bottom of your screen, and our team will be taking note of this. So likewise, for our attendees via Facebook, you please type in your comments, your questions by the comment section of it. So we begin this webinar with welcome remarks from the organizing universities, starting from Father Roberto C. Yap, the Society of Jesus. Father Bobby Yap is the president of the Ateneo de Manila University and the project holder of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines project. Father Bobby will be followed by Dr. Clement C. Camposano who is the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Visayas. We wish to thank Father Bobby and Chancellor Camposano for preparing and sending us their pre-recorded videos to welcome all the guests and attendees for today's webinar. So let us now watch their video. On behalf of Ateneo de Manila University, I welcome you all to the third webinar in the 2021 lecture series of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines, Investing in Climate and Disaster Resilience Project and the National Resilience Council. We thank the local government of Iloilo City and Mayor Jerry Trenas and the University of the Philippines Visayas and Chancellor Dr. Clement Campo Mosano for partnering with the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines and the National Resilience Council, not only for this webinar, but more significantly for our joint efforts in addressing the equity, resilience, and sustainability issues we face in our country. The stories and diverse perspectives of the members of the academe, local government, coastal communities, and development professionals in the Visayas, all represented in today's webinar, are essential in helping us better understand how the challenges of equity, resilience, and sustainability are addressed on the ground. Their practice and experience can provide us with insights which may, we may apply to our own work, our own communities and organizations, and more broadly, to the rest of the Philippines. I turn you over now to Chancellor Campomosano and our speakers with this quote to reflect on from the late Kofi Annan, 7th Secretary General of the United Nations. I quote, gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It is a precondition for meeting the challenge of reducing poverty, promoting sustainable development, and building good governance. Unquote. Good morning to all, and I wish you all an insightful webinar. Warm greetings to everyone. Before anything else, please allow me to acknowledge the City Mayor, the Honorable Jerry Trenas the President of Ateneo de Manila University, Father Roberto Yap, the President of the National Resilience Council, Antonia Yulu Loizaga, 
and engaged sociologist and prime mover of coastal cities at risk in the Philippines, my good friend, Dr. Emma Porio. Maayong aga sa inyong atanan. Gender and resilience are two areas where the UP Visayas wants to be heard, but it is really the second part of this webinar's title that interests me this morning. The emphasis on stories from the ground could not be more relevant. Let me explain. We academics are fascinated with theories. A serious academic is never without some form of theoretical commitment and for good reason. Theories allow us to move past the welter of facts and engage in knowledge production. Theories, such as those on gender and resilience, allow us to describe social phenomena and hypothesize about relationships between them. Theories serve as lenses for understanding, for making sense of the world around us. However, many of us forget that theories are nothing more than models of reality and that they can also serve as blinders. Edward Said reminds us, for instance, that theory can never be complete just as one's interest in everyday life is never exhausted by models or theoretical abstracts of it. In fact, no system or theory exhausts the situation out of which it emerges or to which it is transported. Theoretical commitment, therefore, needs to be paired with critical awareness, which is awareness of the resistances to theory, of the reactions to it elicited by those concrete experiences or interpretations with which it is in conflict. Theories, then, should always hover low over the facts. And for this reason, theories need to be nourished by stories from the ground if they are to retain their vitality. As we explore the link between gender and resilience, and as we try to craft policies that reduce our risks, it is the stories from marginalized and vulnerable communities that will help us find our bearings. Will addressing gender inequality and inequity make for more resilient communities? I believe so, but how and why are not matters for theoretical speculation. Let us listen then to these stories from the ground so we don't lose our way. Thank you and good morning. So thank you, Father Yas and um, Chancellor Camposano. Thank you, Father Bobby, for emphasizing on the importance of uh, gender equality as a need for sustainable development and good governance. And thank you to Chancellor Camposano for highlighting that scientific theories on gender and resilience are best nourished with stories from the ground. So let us now hear from uh, the co-conveners of this webinar, starting from Ms. Antonia Yudo Loizaga, President of the National Resilience Council. Ms. Loizaga is also the co-principal investigator of the Coastal City Satris in the Philippines Project and the member of the Board of Trustees of the Manila Observatory. I now hand over to Ms. Antonia Lanzaga. Thank you very much, Ina, and good morning to all. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Honorable Jerry Trenas, Father Bobby Yap of the Ateneo de Manila University, and UPV Chancellor, um, Dr. Camposano. Thank you very much for the continued support that you all are giving to the National Residence Council and we hope to engage even further, especially on this issue of gender and equality and resilience. First slide, please. As you all know, the National Resilience Council has adopted a framework that shows the interdependence of all the different sectors in terms of reaching resilience and becoming a resilient city. To those of you who are yet to be introduced to our work, we have adopted five pillars, aside from leadership in governance that is based on evidence in order for us to reach the kind of change in terms of resilience that each of our cities must attain. We have human development, the local economy, the infrastructure and buildings and lifelines, the environment, as well as human security. Our work in gender is just beginning 
and it is in fact being informed constantly by the work of Dr. Emma Porio, the work of Jessica Bersilia, and all of you as we engage in working together in the different pillars that are genders in fact sensitive to, to attainment of the particular goals and, and milestones. So if I may, I'd like to introduce these ideas and these are not new, you all have them. However, as part of my introduction today, I'd like to bring them up and highlight them. The next slide, please. As we know, hazards may differ and they're constantly changing and they may even compound. But climate and disaster risks are really rooted in exposure and vulnerability. Where gender-based inequalities exist due to culture, traditions, socioeconomics, the exposure and vulnerability to typhoons, droughts, hazards, earthquakes, and even biological hazards such as COVID-19 drive the impacts of the disasters. But that's only one half of a perpetuating cycle. These impacts of climate change and other hazards will also deepen and amplify future risk for those who are already marginalized based on gender. We all know that we are impacted differently by these hazards, but in our culture, predominantly, and I speak to our own gender, women, women are the copers and the adapters. They are the first responders to the demands of maintaining the well-being of the family through their own household work. And oftentimes, they also need to bring back an income to, to actually address the daily needs of the family. Women make decisions on food, education, health, and, and they heavily influence them when they don't make those decisions directly. This means that women are often the first lines of defense when it comes to transforming exposure and vulnerability of households and where they are heard in the community and in the workplace where there is inclusion, they actually have contributions to make to transforming exposure and vulnerability. As a productive force, they must have a voice. Where gender-based inequities exist, the role of women, not just as stakeholders, but as, but as stockholders in resilience is undermined and undervalued. By disregarding or diminishing social, cultural, environmental, economic con contributions based on gender, a fundamental human inequity is being perpetuated. When in fact, recognizing these value contributions may be part of the key to attaining a climate and disaster resilient future. On that note, I wish to thank Dr. Emma and Jessica both my co-principal investigators in CCAR2 and wonderful advisors, significant contributions to the work of the National Resilience Council for co-organizing this forum. May we have a very fruitful discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tony. Up next, I wish to introduce webinar co-convener, Dr. Emma Porio. Dr. Porio is the project leader and principal investigator of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines project and a professor of sociology at the Ateneo de Manila University. She is also a science research fellow of the Manila Observatory. So let us now welcome Dr. Emma Porio. Thank you, Ina. Um, hello. Okay. Thank you, Ina. Welcome to the webinar on gender and resilience in a coastal city, stories of equity and sustainability from the ground. Before I start, I would like to thank the generosity and kindness of Father Roberto Yap, our president, the National Resilience Council president, Maria Antonia Yolo Loisaga, to our partners in Iloilo Ilo City, the Honorable Mayor Trinias, and the UP Chancellor, um, Clement Camposano. Here, I would like to give a special thanks to my good friend and colleague, Clement, way back from the Philippine Studies Association and the Anthropological Association of the Philippines, and now the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Visayas, and very much a big supporter of CCARPH and the National Resilience Council. Thank you. I cannot over in extend more than my uh, gratitude to you. I would also like to thank especially Jessica Versil Dr. Versilia 
for spearheading the organization of this webinar and also for bringing in the, her colleagues from UPV, the LGU and the CSO partners, as well as the community-based partners from the ground. We owe you a debt of gratitude. The Coastal Cities at Risk project at Transit Supplementary Action Research under the Office of the President of Ateneo de Manila in partnership with the National Resilience Council feel very privileged for the past three years. Why? One, we have the best and the brightest of minds from the University of the Philippines of Sayas, the likes of Dr. Pip Padilla, Dr. Gay de Fiesta, Jessica Dator Versilia, and many more like Alan and Leia for supporting us all these years. Number two, the UPV in partnership with the Iloilo City local government and Mayor Trinas has fully supported CICAR PH, Manila Observatory and the National Resilience Council in the climate disaster risk assessment of Iloilo in support of the Iloilo City LGU Resilient Program under the National Resilience Council. Three, this could not have been done without the support of the Iloilo Cities DRRMO, Donna Magno, uh, CPDO Butch Piñalosa, Francis Agodo, uh, Franco Agodo, and Francis Cruz. To all of them, I'm very grateful for supporting SICAR PH as well as the National Resilience Council in our partnership with you. Number four, we are also privileged to have the support of the private sector in Iloilo, represented here in today's forum by Natalie Lim. I still can remember three years ago, the forum we had with the private sector, wherein they identified water security in Iloilo City as a major issue. And uh, I'm very happy to tell you that hopefully this May, uh, we will have a webinar focused on gender, water security, and governance. Thank you, Natalie, and all the partners. We are also happy to say that our action research partnership with UPV scientists, Iloilo LGU, uh, civil society and community-based organizations, I'm very proud to say, and in fact, I told Father Bobby and the scientists here in Ateneo de Manila that in Iloilo City, we have articulated very well the three principles of transdisciplinary research. One, co-generation of knowledge with stakeholders. Two, co-creation of capacities of scientists and practitioners. And these two principles should lead into co-ownership and co-benefits of the whole and our whole enterprise. SICAR PH, in partnership with the NRC, is very much committed to bringing science and technology to the ground and up in order to support and promote um, equity, resilience, and sustainability on the ground, as well as in the institutions that we are partnering with. These principles inform, I would say, the public-private partnerships here in Iloilo City, and it bodes very well for our vision of a just, sustainable, and equitable, resilient city where both men and women and all genders contribute to the crafting of resilience initiatives, making Iloilo City one of the most dynamic cities in the country. Again, welcome to this webinar, and I would especially thank all of you from all the com different communities of practice, academe, CSOs, CBOs. We owe you our breath of gratitude for sharing your stories of resilience, of equity and sustainability, and moving us forward and guiding us forward with your stories, your sacrifices, and all your commitments to a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Doc Emma. And now we officially begin the lectures with a keynote address from the Honorable Mayor Jerry Trenias, Mayor of the City of Iloilo. We should thank Mayor Trenias for taking the time for preparing and recording his keynote address. To the webinar. So let us now watch the video.
Iri-illusitive the land area of 7,384 hectares with 180 barangays clustered into seven districts is home to world-class festivals, delectable food, and majestic heritage structures. But it is also home to Ilongos who face the risk brought by natural and human-induced hazards due to the geographic location including its social vulnerabilities. We have typhoons, flooding, maritime accidents, earthquake, water scarcity, fire, oil spill, and storm surge, including pandemics brought about by infectious and non-infectious diseases. The risk brought by these hazards also pose a challenge to our governance as local leaders. The Iloilo City government has always been committed to advancing the rights of all sectors and acknowledging the great things each gender can accomplish. So we always make sure to utilize our people and maximize their potentials. There may be challenges to developing a common understanding of approaches to resilience and gender equality. But if we all continue to properly educate everyone, organizations will start to realize that each gender is best in a particular given situation, and that is what we would like to regularly practice here in Iloilo City. Through our Gender and Development Program, we create mechanisms for gender mainstreaming of programs, projects, and activities. Our City Risk Reduction Management Office that works closely in developing our resilience pillar has Donna Magno as head. Although most of the on-ground work of the CDRRMO are associated with masculine tasks like rescue operations, women are better in facilitating projects and are believed to be more organized in decision-making. During the enhanced community quarantine period, the donation drive was led by the Ililo Festivals Foundation Incorporated that gathered ingredients used for the Oswag community kitchens that provided food for the people. We activated 240 community kitchens headed by my daughter, Isa, that served 2.2 million meals for the Ilongos. We also utilize our Blue Angels volunteers who are all women because we know for a fact that women work better in doing kitchen stuff and are more compassionate compared to men. While we utilize male volunteers in more physical tasks such as delivering of ingredients in the 240 community kitchens. The Oswag Kitchen Patrol was headed by my wife, Rosalie, with volunteers from the LGBT office. The initiative provided pack meals to medical frontliners, border guards, and operations center staff. Our compliance team that ensures everyone follows the set guidelines and protocols is headed by Jack Conlo. His staff are mostly male because their work involves roaming around the city even under the heat of the sun to make sure that everyone adheres to the protocols. Most of the male job order employees were also in charge of the relief operations during the enhanced community quarantine because it involved carrying of heavy relief goods delivered in different areas of the city. Different types of disasters may affect communities in multiple ways, but the Illusion City government is at the forefront in ensuring that the risk brought about by these disasters will have lesser impacts to the people and the community. We look forward to a more resilient Iloilo City to respond to various complex disaster risks. And this can only be achieved 
if we all work together. There is a need for us to empower all genders in order for us to achieve a gender equal society where every individual has the capacity to create significant contributions in the community. Madamo Gidya Salamat, Ushwag Ilongo. Thank you again to Mayor Janias for and the rest of his team for informing us of the women-led initiatives of Iloila City and emphasizing on the importance of empowerment as we continue to achieve gender equality. Now let us welcome our second keynote speaker who will discuss gender and social vulnerabilities. Dr. Gay de Fiesta is the lead researcher of the study on social vulnerabilities in Iloila City and faculty at the Division of Social Sciences at the University of the Philippines, Visayas. I now hand over the floor to Dr. Gay de Fiesta. Thank you, Ina. Uh, good morning, everyone. My task uh, today is to present uh, Gender and Social Vulnerability, the case of Iloilo City. Uh, for context on women's vulnerability to climate change and disasters, studies show that women and girls suffer more from disasters and impacts of climate change because they are poorer, less educated, and often excluded from political and household decision making. Statistics show that more women died or injured in major calamities such as the Indian tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, and the Bangladesh floods. Because they're unable to leave the house, they did not learn survival skills such as swimming or as simple as climbing a tree, and they have less physical strength due to chronic malnutrition arising perhaps from inequalities within the household, wherein men and boys are prioritized in terms of nutritious food. Women and girls are also marginalized in relief operations and are often victims of violence and rape in evacuation centers and temporary shelters. In one of our studies in the coastal uh, uh, area here in Western Visayas, we found out that women were marginalized indeed in relief operations because their, uh, their outputs or their work were uh, valued less. So that's why they got less uh, uh, relief operations and compensation. So we have to address the we have we have to address this inequality because gender equality is basically is the basic and a fundamental human right, and women have an important role to play in disaster and climate resiliency work. Social development will never be achieved if a segment of society are left behind. So let me share with you the social vulnerability study uh, in Iloilo City. So we conducted this study for the climate and disaster risk assessment of Iloilo City under the Coastal Cities at Risk project. And um, here we looked at social vulnerability to show the socioeconomic and political contexts in which hazards occur. Thus, it encompasses gender issues. We define social vulnerability as a pre-existing condition and an inherent characteristic driven by social, political, historical, and economic processes and structures such as gender relations, um, income inequality, and property rights. Social vulnerability weakens a person, a group, or a community's ability to prevent human suffering and economic losses and disasters. So for our study, we constructed a social vulnerability index of Iloilo City for the 180 barangays using the uh, PSA or data, census data in 2015 and the 2017 barangay profiles. The index included 18 variables or indicators of social vulnerability, including age, population, 
population density, dependency, housing, informal settling, disability, education, and water access. So these are all indicators of social vulnerability. Our methodology, uh, we used factor analysis using principal components method. And from the 18 variables, we were able to condense that into eight factors. And we did the uh, we applied an index construction method to come up with scores, index scores, or social vulnerability index scores for each barangay. We, we tested our model uh, for adequacy and uh, significance, and it came out well. So how many women in Iloilo City are socially vulnerable? Our results show uh, we, we, we we divided or we classified the index scores or and the barangays into low moderate, low moderate and high vulnerability. And if you look at the table here, uh, low vulnerability consists of uh, there are num there are thirty six barangays with low vulnerability, one hundred twenty one with moderate and twenty three high vulnerability. Uh, in terms of percentage, number of women in these barangays is. Uh, totaled 53%. That is because there are really more women than men in the in Iloilo City. But this would have implications later on their social vulnerability. Now, the, uh, we also, uh, to look at the female exposure or women's exposure and risk to uh, hazards, we integrated the social vulnerability to the hazards um, to, to hazards, and we selected four. Uh, these are the hazards to which uh, Iloilo is uh, exposed to. These are flooding, COVID-19, storm surge, and drought. And if you look at the barangays at risk, it ranged from uh, 22 to 81 barangays with COVID having the highest uh, number of barangays at risk, followed by flooding, drought, and storm surge. In terms of the number of people exposed, we have it ranged from 98, almost 98,000 to 295,000. And this would range from 21% to 66% of the population. And again, the percentage of female of these, uh, in, in these uh, exposed barangays is more than 50%. Now you might say it's only 51% or 50.2%, but if you translate that into uh, actual numbers, the difference between male and female uh, exposures would be uh, to the thousands. Like for example, for uh, flooding, there are, it's about 5,000 difference, no more female than males. So I also want to highlight persons with disability. Now, uh, on the average, persons with disability, there are 53% women with disability uh, compared to men. So those are the numbers. And this would have um, implications later on the survival and resilience of women. So what are the indicators uh, of uh, vulnerability? So here, we're looking at uh, social vulnerability indicators and women's vulnerability. One is dependency. Dependency refers to the, the number, the percentage of population uh, that are not in the labor force, defined by uh, young dependents, for example, uh, would be uh, people age, aging from uh, 14 and below, and the old dependents are those uh, 64, 66 and above. So again, more women in the, are young and old dependents without the, the capacity to earn, which will affect, of course, their um, ability to cope with disasters or in, the, in disaster situations and even to recover from it. Second uh, indicator, important so the indicator in this study is dwelling made of light or makeshift materials. This refers to housing materials. No? And if you look at the statistics again, or the, the, our statistics show that more women and girls are at risk of being displaced, uh, which means that we expect that evacuation centers 
would be uh, there would be more women and girls uh, in evacuation centers, and of course, putting them at risk of violence against women and children. The third, so the important so the indicator is water. Water in Iloilo City has a lot of water during rainy season, and has no water during dry season. Basically, water here is a problem of access. So uh, when women when women do not have access to water, and remember, women uh, who are mostly delegated to household work, household chores, are the heavy users of water, especially for cooking, cleaning the house, taking care of the children. So this exacerbates the lack of access to water means that they have to uh, spend more time and energy to look and get it. So this exacerbates their already multiple burden situations in the household. And lastly, disability. Disability is also an important indicator and would really affect women's vulnerability. As I have uh, mentioned earlier, more PWDs are women and girls who face higher risks of injury and death during disasters because they are unable to evacuate themselves. So these are the SOVI indicators, important SOVI indicators in relation to women's vulnerability. So now what are the key messages of the simple analysis that we did? Number one, census aggregated data provide important information on the vulnerability of women. Data shows for Iloilo City that women's vulnerability stems from dependency, disability, water access, and poor dwelling conditions. Because of these vulnerabilities, women and girls, girls are likely to suffer more from disasters, get more injured, um, even die, and uh, are less likely to recover from disasters if there's no intervention. So uh, policy should address this specific vulnerabilities of women. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Gay, for deepening today's discussion as we see social vulnerability contextualized in Iloilo City. Up next, we hear the perspectives from the local government. This next session is entitled Women and Men in Risk Reduction Decision Making in Coastal Cities and Other Contexts. We will be joined by Ms. Donna Magno, head of the Iloilo City, Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office, and Mr. Maurice John Caban, Field Planning Officer of the Department of Social, Social Welfare and Development, ESWD Field Office of Region 6, Western Visayas. This session will be moderated by Professor Jessica Dr. Brasilia of the University of the Philippines, the Visayas, and co-proponent of the Coastal Cities at Risk in the Philippines Project. I now hand over to Professor Jessica Delor Brasilia, Ms. Donna Magno, and Mr. Maurice John Cabal. Uh, good morning to this panel. Our um, uh, speakers for today will actually be answering three questions. Uh, one is um, they'll describe to us the work that uh, they're doing, what challenges do they encounter as a woman and man, in the work that they, they are in? And lastly, what are their recommendations uh, to enhance gender and development in the field of climate and disaster resilience in their work in government? So I now turn you over to Ms. Donna Magno, who will start the discussions. Donna. Thank you, Ma'am Jack. Thank you, Ms. Ina. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello to our partners in resilience. So I am Donna Magno, the City Disaster Risk Production and Management Officer of uh, Iloilo City. So I think I am one of those uh, few female dream officers in the country. So uh, the, uh, the work that we do, uh, the mandate of the office as set by RA10121 is uh, to set the direction, the de development, the implementation and coordination of disaster risk management uh, programs in the city. So specifically, it means that as head of the office, I have to um, collaborate and network with the partners. 
to ensure that our uh, pre-disaster activities can lead us uh, towards the reduction of potential losses in terms of lives and damage and uh, damages to properties when uh, disasters happen. So basically, uh, I am involved in the risk assessment and planning activities in the capacity building of uh, key partners on DRR, in the discussion of uh, DRR priorities and investments, including the monitoring of our progress in terms of DRR programs. Uh, in times of disasters, I also take an active role in ensuring that appropriate uh, response measures are coordinated with uh, concerned agencies, uh, to our communities, to our local leaders, and that these are monitored and documented so that our leaders can make uh, informed decisions. So set in the context of COVID-19, so part of the work I do is to attend all those meetings that's related to, to COVID-19, and I'm expected to provide inputs on issues and concerns affecting the, the welfare of our constituents. So we also man the emergency operations center and they have to endure all the stresses brought by, you know, all the inquiries and phone calls regarding the management of, uh, of individuals traveling to Iloilo City or that uh, we have to address issues affecting the, 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 the COVID-19 patients, uh, all the problems associated with it. But I think uh, one of the most critical uh, roles of uh, our office uh, and my role as a disaster risk reduction management officer is that of a risk communicator. We have seen uh, earlier the presentation of uh, Doc Gay and it is our task to call um, public attention to all these issues so that immediate actions such as our uh, disaster risk to flooding, drought, uh, COVID-19, earthquake uh, will be given attention and then appropriately our programs will be uh, implemented by the city government and then we can start working in collaboration with our partners. So I'll stop right here and perhaps I can uh, invite Sir Mao to, to introduce himself as well before I proceed to the next questions. Yes, Mao, can you please proceed? Yes, um, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Jan Kaman. I'm the former team lead of the Risk Resiliency Program, um, Climate Change Adaptation, Mitigation, Disaster Reduction, um, risk reduction of the Department of Social Welfare and Development. So mainly um, my, my job was to lead in the formulation, implementation, and coordination of social welfare and development policies and programs um, with the poor, vulnerable, and the disadvantaged communities of the Western Visayas. So basically in my previous um, assignment, um, my team and I, uh, close um, hand in hand with the uh, local government units of the Western Visayas, mainly on the mitigation and adaptation um, in the hazards and exposure of the climate change and other disasters exacerbated by um, the climate changing and its impacts. And during the uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns and the uh, pandemic. Um, response of the department i am uh, i was the accountable person for um, ensuring na wala magugutom in the province of negros occidental so mainly i traveled to uh, bacolod city to bring relief goods because uh, the, that's the entry point no, for the Necros Occidental province at the same time my team also augments during disasters in the assessment the, in the rapid uh, damage assessment at the same time, um, we also work hand in hand with the local government units in counterparting with the rehabilitations of the damaged areas. And that's it for me. Um, thank you very much, uh, Donna and uh, Mao. And uh, going back to Donna, um, you earlier mentioned, as you earlier mentioned, you are one of the uh, very few uh, LD, female LDRMOs in the Philippines. Uh, what challenges do you encounter as a woman in that area of work? And the same thing goes, uh, the same question will go to uh, Mao later. Yeah. Yes, Mom Jack, thank you. So I work in a world, uh, I work in a world dominated by men. And that means I have to struggle to be heard as a woman and to be taken serious, seriously in the work that I do. Uh, I am petite and I, I am in a work, 
wherein mostly uh, men can be can be found in this arena. So, for example, there was a time when uh, several vehicles were uh, several vehicles donated by an international NGO was uh, uh, was delivered in the city, and then a few weeks later, I think we purchased a rescue truck, and so it was also delivered. And then the mayor decided that all these uh, vehicles will be under the care of the city disaster risk reduction and management office. So after the mayor gave that an uh, announcement and the meeting was over, uh, all these men, most of the of them are department heads, came to me and said, "Donna, what is it that you really want? Do you want to become a firefighter or a responder? All this equipment uh, just uh, uh, were given to your office." So do you think you can manage this? Do you think you have that capacity to do that? Do you even understand about vehicles? <laughs> and so I just smiled, ma'am, because for me, I don't have to tinker with the engines. I don't have to drive the fire truck. I can always uh, leverage with uh, our partners and organize our office so that, you know, appropriate uh, people and, uh, you know, structures can be installed so that we can have all this equipment uh, used and uh, uh, made operational by the office. So... You see, uh, when you operate in a world that is uh, uh, highly uh, occupied by men, it is kind of intimidating at times. And, uh, you know, I have to gather my, all my courage to save my peace as well. So I keep in mind that the courage that they have as a petite, they are our leader, can open opportunities for our people and can support the work that we do uh, in our office. So most of the time I have to assert myself. Well, I'm not much of a talker, but if the situation calls for it, I have to assert myself because I, I believe that I have to be heard and all these issues that I, I put in front of, of our partners are essential so that, you know, different partners that we work with, especially uh, uh, representing the women's sec sector can benefit from all these uh, discussions. So as, apart from that, uh, we also encountered no, uh, issues on the participation of women in our work because most of the time, like when we go to the barangays, uh, when we call for meetings, it is always uh, men who would uh, attend. So uh, representing the views of the women, is, uh, the representation, I mean, on the views of the women is very, very low so that when we talk about uh, programs, projects, this is... Uh, uh, mostly geared towards uh, response programs and it is always a uh, training for men. So the investment on DRR is always on that, uh, has that kind of leaning. So we just hope that uh, uh, we can address this and to have uh, more women on our side working for disaster risk reduction. Okay, thank you very much, Donna. And now, Mao, uh, throwing to you the same question. What were your challenges, you know, as a man working in the field of SICAM DRR um, in, in the region? Yes, Mao? Um, yeah, before anything else, um, an interesting fact about my job is we are dominated by women. <laughs> so it's a contrast no, with the case of Mam Donna Magno. And I find it amazing the the way women thinks it's more created than men and i recognize that as a uh, more of a strength rather than a um, threat especially for um, a manager like like me um but what i um experienced is that um policies and uh, and some of the guidelines um created no uh, especially in my line of work, uh, are mostly only for women. So I think the the we need to also balance that the men has also has the need. No, okay. Um, on our on our part, what's being written in the guidelines is only specifically for women, and we don't have um, specific guidelines, especially for the needs of men in time of of disaster and in. Also, uh, the way we think as well, um, in the disaster response, we have uh, identified those areas uh, for women and children. And, uh, there, and, and we also provide them with, um, uh, let's say, appropriate needs like their, um, their kit for women and children, however, men 
are not being provided with that, especially as well during the response, no? um, during the, in times of disaster response, what is being provided are the needs of my colleagues, uh, women then. So that's that's a challenge, but however, I, I find it as, as um, uh, interesting at the same time, um, an opportunity for myself to always be ready na, that we need to embrace this kind of uh, empowerment to women because I myself, uh, I believe in the empowerment of women. So I don't think that as a disadvantage rather than it's um, an opportunity to appreciate things like that. And I'm sad also to hear the way Mam Donna is hearing that in her agency or in the local government uh, unit that she's working with, it's actually, um, more um, going, uh, parang gearing towards the need of uh, of men. However, I think it's the high time to uh, transfer to the DSWD because DSWD is mainly um, ano siya, dominated by women. I have bosses who are uh, babae at the same time. I have also, um, my team is also di diverse no? and mostly um, member of uh, mostly baba ang kasama ko. But in the communities, no, um, I need to also transcend this and and I reinforce ko din na uh, during decision making and, and identification of the projects and let's say for example in rehabilitation and other areas no, um, handled by our agency, um, the representation of women is really low. And and all the decision making are being made by Maymet. So I think okay. um, we need to work as well on that one. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Ma. And finally, you know, in the last few minutes that we have, now those are very interesting insights, you know, from your own experiences. And um, so moving forward, how do you think can we enhance, you know, uh, um, gender and development in the in our work on climate and disaster resilience? What are your what 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 strategies would you suggest, Donna? I Yes, Ma'am Donna. Uh, Sir Mao mentioned this earlier. Yes. Uh, and we can do this by opening the avenues for men and women to become more informed on gender and disaster risk uh, reduction and resilience. Because I think, uh, I, or I believe that knowledge building will be a stepping stone for everyone to understand the issues on inequities and inequalities of uh, men and women in DRR. So arming themselves with the right uh, knowledge can lead to informed decision-making in DRR, uh, like in DRR investments, uh, DRR programs for men and women. And this can help increase in making their voices heard, particularly of the women, and which can also inspire other young men and women to engage in DRR. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Donna. So, so see, Sir Mao, it does not mean that she has to move to your agency. You know, there are the various pathways, you know, by which they, the women can be empowered in their own workspaces. And maybe now hear from you on the strategies that you would suggest, you know, moving forward. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, um, yeah, I recommend that we need to formulate uh, more strategies that will provide an increased representation of women in the field of SICAM DRR. Um, we need also those uh, creative minds, no? Okay, if we will um, just allow them to empower women, um, of course, they can also contribute to a society where the poor, vulnerable, and disadvantaged families and communities empower uh, can improve the quality of life. No, okay, we in the SWD we always uh, envision that no, that we have an equality uh, towards the project implementation at the same time, uh, betterment of our uh, communities, and we. Uh, we should also encourage our local government units no, um, to empower their um, female or women leaders in terms of decision making. And they will be given um, equal putting just like with, with the, their men counterparts. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Uh, Maurice has been explaining yesterday that if you look at, for example, the statistics on who are involved in the SICAM DRR work, it's mostly women. But he has been articulating yesterday that in platforms of decision making, it's mostly men. So very, very interesting uh, dynamics. And um, 
So uh, we, we've heard from um, the experience of our uh, local government units, a representative from the local government unit and from a national land agency. And we hope to have um, a deeper conversation when we have time for Q&A later on. So thank you very much. Mao and uh, Donna, thank you for this session. I now turn us over to uh, Ina, who will introduce the next panel. Thank you again, Mao and uh, Donna. Thank you very much for the well-moderated discussion for Ms. Jerk um, with Ms. Donna and Sir Mao. So in our next session, we emphasize on the perspectives from the coastal communities in Haro, Iloilo City. This session is entitled Conversations on gender roles in food and water security among displaced and resettled indigenous people. Here we feature stories from Ms. Silvia and Pastor Rogelio Elosendo of the Aita community in Lanip, Haro, Iloilo City. We are also very thankful to be joined by the teachers from the Chuchoteg Ana Rose Foundation High School, Ms. Joyce Masangkay Nagnal and Ms. Ann Katakuta. This session will be moderated once again by Professor Jessica Dator Brasilia of the University of the Philippines and Sikar Beach. Let us now hear from Ms. Silvia Alessandro, Pastor Rogelio Alessandro, Ms. Joyce Nagnal, and Ms. Ann Katakutan, and Ms. Jessica Brasilia. The floor is now yours. Okay. Maayong aga. Uh, may we have your video. So we're we're very happy no, to have amongst us again, as we said, uh, si... Uh, Mom Joyce, uh, Mom Ann, and uh, Pastor Elisendo and Mom Sylvia. Now, people might be asking um, who they are and uh, and uh, what role do they play in climate and disaster resilience. Uh, this group of beautiful persons are actually part of an initiative uh, with uh, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Operations Plant Back Better project uh, in partnership with um, uh, uh, National Resilience Council and other stakeholders um, in Iloilo City government, uh, private sector, and uh, we had uh, the opportunity also to get to know them in um, the coastal cities at risk. So uh, for this session, we will also ask, no, um, uh, um, uh, Ma'am Sylvia and uh, Pastor, uh, and uh, Mam Ma Ann and Mam Joyce to describe no, uh, their their work in uh, plant back better. Uh, Pastor, uh, pwede yung ma-explikar kung paano ka mo nakasulod sa plant back better. Uh, so you, you can speak in uh, English or Filipino or in Hiligaynon and then we will just translate later. Pastor, please. Hmm. Okay, good morning. Uh, Ma'am Jessica and uh, the other uh, panelists, uh, we would like to thank God and praise God that uh, uh, of all places in Iloilo City, Barangay Lanit has been the chosen by uh, APEC to be a pilot project of PBB or Plant Back Better Garden. Uh, Nagapasalamat kami nga dire na iwat ini nga project kaga ang akon nga bahin amuang pag attend just to attend the, the seminar nga gin himo Derigid sa sulod sang amon na simbahan and uh, <clears throat> the seminar was uh, uh, conducted by the experts from uh, Taiwan uh, gintagaan kami nila sang lecture kaga mga techniques kung paano kami mag uh, tanom sa mga talamunon nga sa mga utanon para nga ini mangin maayo pag matambok at uh, tanawon 
Pastor, before you proceed, siguro i-explain ta, no? We will ask, uh, you know, for for those who do not know about LANIT and your community, uh, la, uh, this is a community of Aitas, no? Who used to, uh, you know, roam around the city. They were highly itinerant and um, some of them engaged in Um, and, uh, no, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're begging on the streets and the city government uh, made an initiative to uh, give them space no? uh, in, in, in a, a, a part of the city where agriculture was still possible. No? But uh, perhaps you can explain, Pastor, what was the situation of the ITAS then, you know, before the, before the Plant Back Better project? Yes, uh... before sa plant back better garden garden uh, projects ng ipek ang mga ate uh, naga naga lalapta at naga lihok lihok sila sa sudad naga pakilimos uh, ako sa to dere sa sudad sa isa ka boarding house na paagi sa ano sa Gaisano City in front of Gaisano City nagdara ang mga ate naglalapta naghinda taga uh, uh, sing mga balay taga uh, may isa katigulang uh, na na istorya ko ng uh, uh, sa malipot na istorya paka isa ko galit bangod ang nanay niya kagang tatay ko hugutod so nag uh, sakit ang akon nga uh, balatyagon sa pagtan-aw sa ilang sitwasyon kag uh, siling ko sa pagwaling ko siling ko kung may kwarta lang ako mabakal gid ako sang luta nga dire sa siyudad para nga uh, ma makaistar ini sila kag uh, mapatindugan sang maskin simple lang ng mga kamalig ato nga uh, pangamuyo akon gin sabat sang Ginoo bangod nga last 2010 we were invited sang amon nga uh, uh, missions organization nga nagasupot sa amon sa US nagalakat uh, kami ni Mrs. sa US kag uh, nagrace kami sang sang fan para nga mabakal gitang duta. So uh, sa malipot na istorya inay nga duta gin raise namon na lin sa US kag ang city government tinagi sa sa pa sa kay Mayor Jed Patrick Babilo nagbulig para nga mapatindugan ini sang mga balay. So may mga balay gidre ang mga ate kag uh, 24 houses ini kag uh, gin uh, himuan ini sang karsada palibot git sa community recently pasalamat kami sa more power kay napasudla na diri sang sang electric connection ang mga balay sang mga ate so mo ini ang background sang among um, community before sa uh, Uh, pag-abot sa epic project. Okay. Uh, so uh, very briefly, Pastor was saying no that uh, he while he is an ita himself no uh, but he 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 actually um, uh, heads uh, at a, a local church and he found out that many of the itas were homeless uh, living on the streets and in one of those encounters he found out that he has relatives among those homeless itas and so. Uh, together with his church, they endeavored to uh, raise funds um, uh, through help from uh, uh, another country in in, in the U.S. Uh, it tried to raise funds so that uh, they can build uh, homes for the Aita. So they were able to raise uh, enough funds uh, to buy a lot and to uh, build about 24 houses for those Aitas. And uh, at the same time, um, they had support from the local government uh, unit to develop the community. And most recently, they had private sector uh, um, assistance uh, in ensuring that they had electricity access. Now, so let me now go to Ma'am Sylvia. 
no si Ma'am Silvia. Ma'am Silvia, how um uh, what what you know how, how important was the Plant Back Better project? No, ano ka importante ang Plant Back Better project uh, uh, para sa inyo kag ano ang naging role sang kababainhan dera sa Plant Back Better. Yes, Ma'am Silvia, please can can you come here? So thank you, Pastor. We will hear from Ma'am Silvia now. Good morning. I am Silvia Elosendo, working in Ati Tribes Mission, incorporated as a missionary in ANM since like 1990, together with my husband. And God provide a piece of land for us here in land at 3,000 square meter. In Barangay, Planet Haro, Iloilo. Our village composed of 24 families and we are 120 all in all. And these Ati families are just roaming around in the streets. Some of them are city, uh, staying around the Barangay City as, as quarters. So this is the first time they have a house here in, in, in Iloilo. And they have, we have also a beautiful building. And by God's mercy and grace, we are very grateful to God that in spite of this COVID pandemic, as the Ati pastor's wife and all Ati community are able to survive in this hardship and suffering in, the, in this pandemic. And God answered our prayer in this because God is faithful, He lead and guide the epic to come in our place. Last May 19, 2019, and then second, and we conduct a training, and then second training is last July 9, 2019, until we found out that that mayor training has allowed APIC to pilot Ilu Ilu about plant back better. That is the most significant thing that happened to our community. After the trading, we apply it, and for the first time, we're in amazed the fruits of our garden because we have a better production that we could be able to survive in hunger. This is the reason why we are very, very grateful to God. Number one, every day we have a feeding program in our community, and we enjoy eating vegetables and papaya fruits. Second, we could a, be able to sell to the people around us. We have an extra income now. And then the third, we have a, a skill and knowledge about gardening agriculture, and in agriculture to support the family. So the Ate, instead of begging in the streets, now they are working in the garden to survive. And we can say that we are people who are resilient in this COVID pandemic. So we are very grateful to God, to APIC, to our mayor, to NGOs, companies, universities, local government unit, to school principal teachers that we are, they are very supportive to, our, to, to us. So thank you very much and may God bless us all. Uh, Ma'am Sylvia, let me ask you, no? Bisan... Okay, sorry, sorry for for cutting in, uh, Ma'am Sylvia. I, 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 you can answer it, no, in in Hiligay, no? and then we'll just uh, translate it. Um, what many of you did not know is that only about four of the ITAs were part of the initial project, you know. But what was interesting, but that it was that Ma'am Sylvia and the group of ITA women, they were actually listening in to the seminars in you know the ground floor of the training program and while listening they took notes and then they started working on their own uh and developing the the their own plots even before the former plots of the the uh, the, the project started um uh, ma'am silvia ano naging role sa mga kababainhan no kag paano nabuligan ang mga kababainhan nga ayta dera sa inyo nga nga community sang uh, santo nga buluhaton Ma'am Silvia kababayan anamon nga mga ate di before they are just begging and then roaming around the streets but now they are working in the garden so they are now helping to their families 
They have now food, vegetables to cook to their children. So, so, wala, ben- sila, yeah. so they don't uh, beg anymore, kami, Ma'am Sylvia. Wala kami direct COVID because we have a lots of vegetables in our village. That's why we are resilient in this pandemic. Okay. So thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Ma'am, Ma'am uh, Sylvia. And supporting um, the community of, of AITA, you know, are the teachers from the Chuchu Tag Found Foundation. And these are the two, you know, formidable women, uh, Ma'am Anne and Ma'am Joyce, you know, who have been with them and uh, to share their journey, um, despite that they're also parents and mothers, you know, they, uh, they've been devoting their time to to help in the, 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 the area of work. Uh, Ma'am, uh, what drove you as women no? uh, to, to make extra time no? to, to serve and work with the AITA community? Ma'am Joyce, Ma'am Anne? Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. No, at present, I am a EBB facilitator as well as the ITA coordinator. So we started the PBB project last 2019, and uh, the participants are uh, the youth, the 4 h club, officers and members, the relocates, uh, the 4 uh, parents, and uh, the indigenous people here in the community. So this project has two phases. This is the phase one, which is in school, the flower garden, and uh, phase two here in the community, the vegetable garden. So during the implementation of this project, we experienced uh, many challenges. First, we experienced the drought during the land preparations. And then uh, typhoon on the process and uh, floods that made us uh, disappointed. But participant, uh, the time is almost gave up because of the challenges. But they saw us, uh, Mom Joyce and me, and uh, the AITAs are very persistent and motivated to continue the project. So despite the typhoon, heavy rains, and the strong winds, our flowers and vegetables stand and bloom beautifully. So this project made the uh, Iloilo City proud and uh, became model to other countries. So we also equip the participants with the uh, knowledge, the technology, and skills, and now they are the organic agriculture production in situ holder. So not only nga nagpractice sila, but they equip also with a certificate so that they will be uh, proud also. So they survived in this pandem- pandemic because they have food on um, their table. So wala pong gutom dito sa lanit, no? because nga uh, marunong po sila and then they have uh, the technology already in themselves. So I embrace farming. That is why also I equip myself with trainings. Now me and uh, Miss Joyce are trainers methodology one holder in organic agriculture. In fact, we are conducted a seminar workshop on uh, JPT Ediscape uh, project of Mayor Trenyas and helping the office of the city agriculturist. So as a motivator and educator of agriculture, six of our graduates enrolled in agriculture, including my son. So hoping that this year the farm school will put up here in Barangay Lanet, where we can share our expertise to our future learners as well as the farm school in urban settings. So those are the background in our uh, PBB project. Uh, Ma'am Joyce, before I yes, ask the, another question, would you want to add to that? Yes, ma'am. And this PBB or Plant Back Better project is also um, an eye-opening for us to become an agricultural uh, agriculture practitioner. So this project bouts how we led as women in the labor force of agriculture. Like um, half of the, our participants were the Aita mother. Um, the men help only in land preparation and during harvesting, but the rest of the work was done by women. So our project, the plant back better, is very um, significant to us. Like after three months of waiting, we successfully harvested the fruit of our labor. And you know, we're so proud of it because this project, um, gardening, just a gardening agriculture, 
we were be able to visit Taiwan for free. And as well, what Mom and told a while ago that the ITAS are equipped with their in situ um, certificate. Um, as a speaker naman during the GPTA DISCIP project and integrated urban farming, Level Up um, 2021, the project of our city mayor, Honorable Jerry Petrinas, there we thought our participants, the linkages and the resources that we've learned during our um, during the seminars of our Plant Back Better initiative. So as you see from one pilot barangay, at present, this initiative and resources were, were practiced by almost all the barangays of Iloilo City. So it means um, we are the multiplier of the linkages. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. So thank you very is... much, Ma'am Joyce and Ma'am Ann. Uh, before we go, no, because uh, I am yes, pretty sure there'd be lots of questions later. What, uh, you know, is your most important realization? Kung may naitunan ka nga isagid ka bagay bilang babae, no? From the work that you did, ano ina, no? Mm -hmm. I, that, that's, a, that, that's a question that goes for all of you, no? And also, I want to ask Pastor later, as a man, what has he learned, you know? Uh, Paunahon ta siguro, Anay, si Pastor, and then uh, we'll go back to you. Uh, just a closing statement. Pastor? Ara na si Pastor? Ara pada siya? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, ang question, ma'am, uh, sa, sa natabo, sa mga initiatives nga ginagyan ninyo, ano ang pi pinaka most important realization nyo? no bilang lalaki kay pastor no bilang kabab kababainhan no bilang babae no sa inyo nga area of work pastor ano ang na ano ang pinaka important realization mo in one sentence ang uh, hindi ko masyado na klaruhan ang ano nagautol-utol ma'am ang imo nga pamangkot Ay, okay. Hindi ka kabati. Ma, sir, ini batian mo na ko, Pastor. Batuan okay, okay ko na. po. Okay. As, oh. uh, Pastor, ano ang pinaka-importante mo nga realisasyon bilang lalaki sa, na, sa uh, inyong initiative sa Plant Back Better? Uh, ang... pinaka importante sa akong nga uh, realization sa among uh, project sa plant back better garden among uh, uh, ang mga lalaki <clears throat> uh, dako ang ilang uh, pwersa kag dako uh, mas uh, Pursado sila sa pag uh, mga mabugat na ulubrahon sa pagsugod sa sang mga project. Ganyan nga sa akong lang uh, ang mga lalaki may uh, dakukid na bahin sa pag uh, Uh, himo sa mga ulubrahong, especially sa mga mabugat ng ulubrahong kung magsugod na ang project. Ang muna nga akong uh, nakita na uh, butang uh, na-realize ko. Okay. Uh, so, hindi nila nga himo. Okay. So, kagina, similar, no? Uh, to what uh, ma'am uh, ma Ann and what ma'am Joyce have said, no, this affirms the fact that, you know, um, in the initial phases of the project, you know, where, uh, you know, physical strength is much needed, uh, that was where the men found their space. No, so thank you very much, Pastor. Let's now go to um, Mom Joyce. What, what, what was your most important realization? Thank you, Pastor. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma thank you. Mom Joyce, you. how about you? Um, I think we need to forget the concept of um, women will just stay at home do, um, doing the household chore, while the men will do the family uh, will do the work for the family. So as a woman of today and of tomorrow, um, 
I really believe that um, there's no such difference between men and women. Because for me, if men can do why women can in any fields of um, things. Okay. Thank you very much, Ma'am Joyce. And si Ma'am Sylvia. Ma'am Sylvia was really the champion no, of the Plant Back Better work. No? And Ma'am, what's your most important realization as a woman no, uh, in that engagement that you just had? Yes, Ma'am. Ma'am Sylvia? Ma'am, oh. kindly repeat, Ma'am. Ma, the same question goes for Ma'am Sylvia. Anong iyang pinaka-important realization? Yes, yes Ma'am Sylvia. Uh, sa ako, Gidya, Ma'am, it's very, very, really significant for us as a missionary. Now we are, are, are really apply what we learn in in agriculture, especially this time of pandemic, because very important the food security. As a mother, as a pastor's wife here in our community, we need to have food in order no COVID in our community. So far, I'm very thankful to Mr. Lord because through the PBB project, we really apply it and we will really work on it until Jesus comes, until because then this is very important. The food security. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And finally, Mama Ann. Mama yes. Ann, the same question. Yes, ma'am. It is very significant because uh, uh, we women in school or teacher in school, no, they the children saw us, no. Kami na mga kababaihan, and dyan po sa garden, nag-work together with the boys. So they also encourage, and then uh, the people in the surroundings also. No? Uh, they uh, replicate the project in their backyard. So bilang nanay, uh, yun siguro ang, ang the most is uh, we have food in our uh, family. We have food in our table. So for that, I am very thankful for this project, for uh, the skills and knowledge that uh, we gain for this. Okay. So thank you very much. No, um, I'm, I'm sorry we have a very little time, but we will proceed with our session. And hopefully during the, the Q&A, there will be more questions uh, coming your way. So please stay. Madam, good na salamat. Uh, Ma'am Sylvia, Pastor, Ma'am Ann, kag Ma'am Joyce. Uh, Madamo, gina salamat. Alin sa amon nga tanan. Thank you. I now turn us over to Ina. Thank you very much, Ms. Jerk. Thank you to our partners, Ina Haro, Ms. Sylvia, um, Pastor Rogelio, Ms. Anne, Ms. Joyce. Thank you for sharing your stories and experiences. Madamo, gina salamat. In the final set of our stories today, we hear perspectives from civil society organizations. This segment is entitled Gender and Intersectionality in the Localization of COVID-19 Prevention, Mitigation, and Response among Riverine and Coastal Communities. We are joined today by Ms. Sonia Kadarnigara, founding member of the Homeless People's Foundation Incorporated, and Mr. Emmanuel Arena, Executive Director of the Iloilo Caucus of Development NGO Networks, or ICO. I now hand over to Ms. Sonia for her lecture, Localized COVID-19 Intervention, the Homeless People's Federation Philippines Experience. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, my name is Sonia. I'm based in Iloilo, and I'm one of the regional coordinator of the Homeless People's Federation Philippines. And I, I think one of the, it's good to speak on the last part of the panel because, uh, as what Mom Gay Di Fiesta said, and Mom uh, Antonio Lusaga uh, said that women are the coopers and. And the study also said it all that most of the affected, especially in the issue of informal settlements and housing, are the women in the communities. So I think that's the reason why Homeless People's Federation is here today. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, with that issue in mind, we remember that during that time when that was 23 years ago, when we don't have this kind of opportunity to be able to speak. 
and to, to be able to be given space to, you know, said what we want to do and also demonstrate our capacity and strength because we're always considered as the, shall we say, the eyesore of the society. When you see informal settlements, you know, the connotation is that we are the problems of the city. And with that, uh, that encourages us to organize ourselves and we find and make solutions to our problems. And uh, we also work in partnership with various stakeholders because we believe that sustainability in, in this kind of uh, engagement is we have to also involve government. So in that uh, case, we were uh, able to empower ourselves that, that what we are going to, or that what we have done today and mostly women uh, take the center role of all this organizing component. And uh, I think one of the, the important thing that we have done is that we also have to count ourselves. So we have uh, a lot of uh, survey and profiling trying to, shall we say, include ourselves in numbers <laughs> because most of the survey sometimes uh, doesn't include us or maybe the data is not accurate. But when people from the ground uh, conducted this kind of profiling and, and, and enumeration, we were able to you know, count ourselves in, in, in all the information that was established by the government. So next, please. Next, please. So for 23 years now, we have constantly proved ourselves to be, uh, to build our capacity. We build the uh, houses, different kinds of houses. We also have uh, a lot of upgrading uh, projects within the communities. But the most uh, important thing that we have done uh, while we organize ourselves is that we, we organize uh, communities towards the issue of uh, security of tenure and housing. And at the same time, we mobilize our own resources. Because they say that uh, communities doesn't have the resources. They are wrong because we can mobilize uh, as to, uh, for now, as, as I speak, we were able to, in Ililu City alone, we were able to mobilize the community savings within the community, around 27 million pesos already. So that's the money that's coming in and out of the communities. And uh, next, please. With regards to COVID intervention, this is how uh, Mom Jack and, and UP come, out, come in in our communities. As I said, we have demonstrated a lot in our capacity, but at the same time, there's always the norm that, you know, sometimes we are forgotten by those who are managing from the top. So when COVID came, uh, communities were freezed because we have to take instructions from, from the executive. But then we said that why do we have to stop and you no, know, not doing anything and just, uh, trying to uh, wait for some uh, maybe relief goods or help from, from the government, we can also help government because we said as we, it is always our motto that we say that we are in, in Ilongo, nagapanimbang kami, hindi kami pabugat sa gobyerno. So that's always the, the maybe Mam Jack will trans, translate that later on. So in this COVID pandemic, we decided to organize ourselves again. And in silence, we were able to, uh, when the city has this community kitchen, the Federation also has community kitchen. We map out also those vulnerable uh, sector within the member of our, of our communities who are unemployed, who are uh, uh, coping with you know, the loss of income. We also map out those who are within inside our communities, those who are affected by COVID. Because, you know, as Mam Dona said, when you are infected with COVID, this is, um, uh, shall we say, this is uh, a secret. But then when you are in a community, uh, you know, you cannot keep it a secret. So it's the community who has to play a very important role also within. If, if one of the member of the, the, the members has, uh, is has COVID, then community should take part in maybe sending uh, food or taking care also of some of the uh, non infected members of the family. So that's what we have done. And um, as I said, apart from the community kitchen, uh, we also train ourselves to do this health monitoring. And we lobby with the government to, to, to do this online medical consultation. 
And the most important thing is that we need money aside from the sardines and the rice that was given by the government and by the barangay. Uh, because my, uh, women uh, savers has money, then we were able to give cash assistance coming from the, from the savings program that we have. So that's, uh, next please. So that, that are some of the uh, initiatives that we have done during COVID. Part of that, we also adhere to the protocols and develop our own hand washing station. We also develop our IEC uh, uh, program, like we also help barangays to be able to, with the little resources that we had, we share also with, with, with the government. And uh, just now Sylvia said that sa ati wala sang gutom because we are also uh, able to help them uh, with their catfish uh, farm from our fund that was uh, from our fund that was generated from the from the funding donor that we had. So this is all the initiatives of the the Homeless People's Federation. Next slide, please. Yeah, with regards to women, I just would like to quote uh, what our uh, Slum Dwellers International President said. Um, he said, the, how do we organize? We work with the women. They have the power, ideas, knowledge. And I always say, if you work with the women, you work with the whole society. If you work with the men, you only work with the 1%. I don't know if everybody agrees with that, but this is related to how uh, we organize communities that women already play a very important role and that was tested and proven in, in, in the aspect of community organizing. I think I end with this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sonia. No? Now let us call on Mr. Emmanuel Ereno or Sir Boyet, Executive Director of the Iloilo Caucus of Development and Geo Networks. Sir Boyet, the floor is yours. Yes. So my presentation is about uh, what we have done with uh, the Iloilo Caucus of Development and Government Organizations or AGFO. Uh, we have been uh, lucky in this period of time to work uh, as a CSO in the localization of COVID-19 prevention, mitigation response among the riverine and coastal communities uh, in Iloilo City. Uh, Iloilo Code NGO had been a sub-grantee of uh, USAID, uh, RTI, Rich Health International, Rich Health uh, Visayas, and uh, as a network of project technical experts and community workers, we provide that technical assistance to the city of Leilo for various capacity building interventions to support the LGU grassroots based uh, COVID-19 response mechanisms in 26 pilot barangays. So as we mentioned, LGU grassroots based, this is uh, actually, we have been uh, uh, through the observance of the protocols, we cannot afford to do webinars all alone to combat COVID, but we have to undertake face-to-face uh, -face technical training so that we can uh, transfer the technologies and techniques to the various communities that are highly exposed to uh, COVID uh, cases. Uh, next slide, please. So the task that we have done uh, in the implementation to delay the activities, we did mobilization of the BHERTS and strengthened the community level risk communication mechanisms. Under that, uh, among the tasks that we have uh, done are the mobilization, the, organi the organizing and capacitating and deployment of the BHERTS, the Barangay Health and Emergency Response Teams, for risk communications and community engagement, also the contact tracers. And for uh, in accomplishment of that, we got overwhelming uh, response coming from the communities, uh, especially the BHERTS who are mostly women. Uh, we have uh, our target, we have reached 101% of the BHERTS who wanted really the uh, training because they said no matter how uh, before, uh, they had been doing only uh, uh, phone instructions or through the uh, through webinars, but then they said 
that really in order to be effective we're able to to do that and for the contact tracers we train them on ipc the uh, infection prevention and control and uh, we have also reached uh, a tremendous uh, uh, response now coming from the communities now and uh, with the ilg and the city health office and then related to the gender issues we really had this uh, problem of uh, uh, discrimination and the uh, lack of attendance to the uh, uh, to the needs of the women and even the LGBTs. No, we did translation, dissemination, and distribution of COVID risk communication messages for gender-based violence, adolescent health, and family planning to the city uh, health office. And uh, with that, we're able to reach out to the 80% of the 20% population uh, of the in 26 pilot barangays. So we have 100% adult population rich through the city uh, partners. And I could uh, uh, implementing members and partners, no? including Kabalaka uh, of the Sonia Cadornigara and Sign Post uh, Philippines. No? And uh, we're also able to help the community to give them linkage and utilize local referrals and network response for gender-based violence in coordination with the uh, city social work and development referral desk, the barangay uh, children uh, protection, uh, uh, barangay council for the protection of children and the uh, women's desk in the city health offices in all the 26 barangays covered. Next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, for the implementation in the containment of uh, COVID, we assisted the city health office, district health office in through coordination and follow up of the barangay led initiatives on, uh, on uh, prevention and control and contact tracing and uh, uh, re, re entry. And uh, with that, again, uh, we have served 102% of the facilities in the six, 26 pilot barangays. And again, uh, tremendously covered 100% of the priority hotspot barangays. And also we conduct uh, related to women care, uh, conduct orientation and menstrual hygiene care and distribute menstrual hygiene and sanitation kits among women and girls we're in, we were able to reach out 204.5%. Again, a very tremendous response coming from the women and girls between the ages of 15 up to uh, 30, uh, where we're, we're able to monitor this with the help of the uh, city social welfare development offices, wherein we held the, because uh, our target was really to do this in halfway to houses, but during the COVID time, uh, the CSWD allowed them to do house clients uh, only right now. And they were sent home during the pandemic. So we have to give uh, these trainings on uh, open house uh, barangay uh, for uh, mental and hygiene sanitation kits now. And uh, we have to do this uh, actually using all the paraphernalia of uh, PPEs. And uh, uh, we have uh, to conduct this with the uh, allowing only around 20 participants per session. And then uh, in the observance of the protocols, of course. And uh, we have assisted also the LGU in leveraging fund from the private sector on the scheme on community participation, especially in the installation of hand washing facilities. No? So we're able to uh, reach 14 uh, no touch hand washing facilities in uh, TTMF, uh, public markets, health centers, and communities now. And even we're able to leverage 70,000 more uh, of, uh, of uh, the commitment coming from the uh, communities now to assist us and help them also to leverage funds coming from the private sector. And even uh, SMCT were able to help Parangay uh, Bulilao in uh, the observance of such. Next slide, please. And then uh, 
also a very good thing was that uh, we're able to organize and facilitate monthly community learning for post and reflect after the we have conducted the major activities that we have done and again tremendous response from the pilot barangays we have organized a uh, uh, five cluster of uh, of the with the five priority hotspot barangays uh, serving as uh, communities of practice uh, as resource persons uh, and testimony sharers in flattening the COVID cases in hotspot barangay along the city coastal areas. A sample of these are uh, shown in the graph below where these are the major uh, areas that we have uh, uh, covered. No? As you can see, uh, of the three, uh, we have actually five uh, barangays and uh, only one was able to, uh, since October, only one was able to uh, have a low case, but the rest, uh, including Boulevard and San Juan, already registered zero case. No? This, uh, this was recorded uh, during uh, January 2021. So next slide, please. So the uh, most important factors that we have uh, uh, really uh, done to get these uh, uh, things to succeed are number one, the support of the DOH Region 6 and the city LGU through the CHO, District Health Centers, city DALG, DSWD, and the city disaster reduction uh, uh, management office of, uh, of uh, DONA. No? highlighted the strong partnership with uh, these, uh, these uh, partners. And the strong support and positive response and active leadership of the community, especially women in the community-based interventions in COVID-19. And the active involvement of the public and private sector, including the print and broadcast media and Ilo code members uh, in the city and pilot communities. But the difficulties that we have encountered is that uh, during this period, really, the LG was so busy with the general COVID activities, including now the vaccination that we directly coordinate with the district health centers and barangay level, uh, city health uh, uh, centers for, with, of course, with the CHO endorsement so that we can uh, go down immediately to attend the uh, available uh, for coordination meetings, conduct of the of uh, technical assistance activities, including monitoring. So with that, uh, Madam Osalamat. Thank you very much, Sir Boyet. And thank you to all our speakers today. Uh, we now move to hear responses and messages mm -hmm. from the academic and private sectors. From the private sector, we begin with Ms. Natalie Mulim, who is the general manager of the Richmond Hotel in Iloilo. She will be followed by Professor Cindy Jimenez, Associate Professor of the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences in the University of the Philippines, Visayas. So I now hand over the floor to Ms. Natalie Mulim. Thank you, Ina. Indeed. The success of Iliilo is in its spirit of diligence, discipline, and inclusivity. Good morning. Allow me to share with you stories of resilience from the ground in Iloilo City from the point of view of the private sector. Um, I'm from the hotel industry, and it is very fortunate that in the hospitality industry through the years, we have celebrated and championed women leaders and women in management roles. In recent years, we have focused our energies on managing disruptions and raising our AQ, our adversity quotient. And crisis management and BCPs, business continuity plans, are much like insurance plans. You, you invest in it and you hope that you'll never get to use it. So nowadays, we have been using it. We've been using it for the past year. So today, we are making use of all the investments we have made. The hospitality has been greatly affected um, in Iloilo, just like in other parts of the world, because we rely mostly on tourists and up until recently on MICE business, on the meetings, incentives, conferences, conventions, and exhibits. And for the past year, women leaders like me um, have had to coordinate with women leaders 
those in the public sector, like Ms. Donna Magno, uh, we've had to communicate, coordinate, and collaborate to continuously overcome um, the hassles and the travails and the challenges of travel and management of movement in and out of the city for the very, very few guests and tourists we have coming in. Recently for our hotel, we have also partnered with women leaders from an organization called One Iluilo, advocating promotion of livelihood for MSMEs, assisting weavers from Iloilo. So these are MSMEs who are assisting uh, weavers of Hablon, the hand uh, loomed fabric uh, that is originally from Iloilo and also baskets made of pandan, seagrass, and all of these other in indigenous materials. Um, and for the hotel, we have found a way to repurpose our hotel spaces because we are unable to open our bar, we are unable to open our lounge due to government regulations. We decided, okay, we will use these spaces to showcase the products that our MSMEs are um, exhibiting to give livelihood to the weavers. Um, so together, we've been able to generate over a million pesos in revenues for the vendors, which translate to livelihood to our hablon and fabric and basket weavers, most of whom are women. So truly, disasters are not all disastrous. Situations like these allow us to channel our energies to viable streams and find higher purpose for, for our work. This introspection for me and without prejudice is mostly possible with women. And as we have seen this morning from the community in Lanit, from the support that Pastor gets uh, to Mam Donna, to Mam Sonia, we are getting a lot of support from women, women leaders who choose to stand out, who choose to make a difference, even um, in a challenging time such as this. So today and not just every day, I hope that we continue to celebrate women in not just in coastal cities, but in every situation and all the decisions that we make uh, in supporting the community, our family, um, and our companies. So thank you very much uh, to all the women leaders and to the women workers out there. I celebrate you. Salute to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Natalie. Um, now I would like to call Professor Cindy Jimenez. The floor is yours now, ma'am. Um, I did prepare just three slides so that it will be a lot clearer and then I can also streamline my presentation and my comments. Now, what is my realization, as Mom Jack will say, while working with gender and now resiliency in coastal communities? Okay, there is a need for inclusivity. Um, that is why gender mainstreaming is very critical because we need to address the social norms. We need to know the patriarchal household or society and other critical factors, which may undermine the ability of all genders, particularly women and girls to be resilient and ultimately affect the entire initiative. We have to recognize that not only women, but the different genders are part of a diverse social and cultural system. And we need to look at this intersectionality because we might be addressing one section of the role, but you are creating issues or conflict in other sections of the role, which affects not only their household, but, but may affect the entire community. Now, if this is not factored in the development of the project activity or activities, it may cause more marginalization for already marginalized sector or even more domestic violence. Now, for example, in the case of providing um, trainings on economic opportunities or livelihood, um, livelihood trusts, we should always include gender sensitivity in the activities, especially within the household. Why? Because it, um, we are working with coastal communities and in the past, past studies we conducted, we learned that when the women start to earn money and they become financially independent, in a way financially independent from the low catch of their fisher husband, domestic violence increases. And this is what we want to avoid in order for, for us to, be, to make women, not only women, but all gender more, more resilient in terms of this um, uh, crisis that you are having. And then we should also teach them financial management. What do I mean by financial management? Just teach them how to save. Because um, I learned 
the the activity from Lanit, the ITAS are now earning. So how will they be able to manage this? So saving for the future. And that is again critical for resiliency because we do not want them to be resilient just today or during this time. Okay, now what are some points to consider? Uh, being a, an educator, I have to put this in. Now, how are the inequities and inequalities manifested in the resiliency programs? And how will you be able to address this? What are your mitigating factors to address these inequities and inequalities? Now, what are the indicators to determine resiliency or increase capacity to be more resilient? How will you determine that within your community, a greater number of the members of the community have become more resilient, not only the women, but also the children, the little girls, the little boys, every, every stakeholder within your community. Now, what are the sustainability mechanisms? At present, we have a lot of money and energy being flowed into communities in response to COVID. But what happens when all this money uh, runs out? What happens when our um, CSOs no longer, uh, no longer have the money to fund all their activities? What about what will now happen to your communities and what will happen to the resiliency programs that you have initiated? That is why sustainability mechanisms are important and in order for us also to document. These are lessons learned. Now, when we say lessons learned, this will be the time also that we can share this with other communities. And going back to um, what Chancellor mentioned earlier, theory and practice. Now we have the marriage of science-based information, data gathering, and activities or actions on the ground. Now, um, another realization is that Capacity, capacitating people to build or enhance their ability to be resilient is a process. That's why we have to consider the sustainability mechanisms and at the same time, gender responsiveness and gender mainstreaming okay, within all activities. As um, cited by some of our uh, resource persons earlier, many of the workers are women. This is good because women are really workers, but we have to be able to encourage the men folk and the other genders to work with us in, in, in a more um, inclusive um, capacitating and resiliency building. That way we minimize also all the other um, negative impacts of our resiliency activities. And thank you very much. And again, mabuhay ang kababaihan. And thank you for all our um, the activities done and the efforts done by our resource persons. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Professor Cindy and Ms. Natalie Lim for, uh, for giving these messages. No, it's a pleasure to have you with us in today's webinar. So now we move to the synthesis and closing of this webinar. No, but I'm pleased to introduce to you Assistant Professor Monique M. Muyergas, who is the Director of the Gender and Development Program Office of the University of the Philippines in the Visayas. So, Prof. Monique, the floor is now yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to um, bring props no, and appreciation to the team who organized this webinar, uh, Gender and Resilience in a Coastal City, um, stories of equity and sustainability from the ground. Thank you, Ateneo de Manila University, National Resilience Council, Manila Observatory, IDRC, CRDI, and UP Visayas. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight a few points um, before I, uh, I drive to uh, the most important uh, closing remarks, I guess. Um, uh, what Mayor Trenyas uh, highlighted uh, that uh, we need to develop a common understanding of gender and resilience. Uh, the concerted efforts from all sectors, the education is key to gender and development in the city and in the entire province to ensure gender and resilience is put forward, especially in these very trying times. Uh, Dr. Gay de Fiesta also highlighted, and I think uh, uh, 
uh, linked into this uh, this whole thing, uh, how gender and social vulnerability is uh, a necessary lens that we need to understand uh, presenting um, vulnerabilities to climate and disasters. Uh, we're in gender disparities in inclusion, skills building and opportunities and access to relief and welfare are important points and uh, concerns that we need to raise, especially uh, this time. No? Vulnerabilities, uh, like what Dr. De Fiesta said, exacerbates already existing multiple burdens and uncovers other vulnerabilities such as abuse, violence, poor access, and marginalization. I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Donna Magno and Mr. Maurice Caban, uh, who talked about their realities in the ground, uh, in their workplaces, in the fieldwork, in their efforts uh, to help um, in terms of public service. Uh, they also wanted to uh, remind us that we need to still create strategies to ensure gender-based concerns are mitigated or corrected uh, by education using gender and resilience that should be highlighted in the workplace, uh, formulate strategies for representation and inclusivity, and more platforms and opportunities in decision-making for women. Um, I would also like to thank Ms. Sylvia, Mr. Rogelio, Ms. Anne, Ms. Joyce, Madam Ukidnya Salama. Thank you for setting the example for our other communities. Your efforts are truly appreciated. Your stories are heard. And we also like to thank, uh, I would also like to thank um, uh, the Homeless People's Federation, uh, uh, Ms. Gador, Niga, Gador Nigara and Mr. Areño, thank you for highlighting gender intersectionality in the localization of COVID-19 intervention. Your work um, has uh, created ripples of change and uh, helped so many people no, uh, within our community. Um, Proceeding on, I would like to anchor on the key points of Father Roberto Yap and the president of Ateneo de Manila, who looked at concerns on gender and resilience, which is which are interwoven and interdependent. Uh, our university chancellor, Chancellor Clement Caposano, highlighted the role of the academe in our efforts to address patterned issues embedded within gender and resilience. The role of theory and theorizing to provide lenses in appreciating the stories in the ground, stories offered by our um, resettled and displaced indigenous peoples and communities. This morning's discourse and storytelling presents to us significant and urgent points. This event, this webinar is a testament of how integrated efforts are imperative to pursue gender and development. Integrated efforts from institutions such as universities, government sectors, women organizations, DRR organizations and agencies. We are a collective, each contributing to making transformative changes, impactful changes on forwarding gender, and, gender equality and equity. Perhaps I speak as an academic, a uh, gender advocate and a woman. Research produced by our university are invaluable. The platforms of education we engage in are conduits of theorizing and theories to create critical awareness of diverse realities, as what Chancellor Camposano highlighted earlier. And of course, our public service and extension projects bridge the university to our communities to better the quality of life of all genders. And that Climate change and risk reduction is an intersectional issue. We cannot view it only through a unidimensional lens. Otherwise, we neglect to clearly see the authenticity of realities from various sectors in our locality. When you tackle gender, we include not only women, but also her intersecting identities that she occupies in her community. We also include men who are our allies in creating this critical movement towards human rights and social justice. And we also include the intersectional and layered gender-based issues in the conversation directed toward informed policy reform, community development, sustainable transformative programs and projects. And lastly, gender and resilience is not new to us. It, is con it continuously evolves with our social and political milieu. The woman may certainly be synonymous to the experience of resilience for generations. The woman is an exemplar of resilience given the hurdles of social injustices she has experienced, such as violence, abuse, marginalization, oppression, lack of representation. 
but we take pride in our resilience, but we need to change that. That climate change and disaster risk reduction is a context wherein we can change that. Women need to take on leadership and decision-making roles. We need to manifest our capacity for power and independence. We need to create ripples of change within and across our communities that suffer the consequences of climate change and disasters. This is a time to make women voices louder and stronger. We need to empower each other as women collective, with men as our allies, and with other marginalized communities. Madamo Gidnya Salama, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Prof. Munito. So we are quietly in terms of our time for the webinar, but we wish to still invite the group, the panelists, the attendees, to stay with us as we continue to proceed with the synthesis and closing of the webinar. No? We will be extending for a few more minutes to allow us to tie in the discussions this morning. So we truly appreciate your support. Now to give the synthesis of the webinar, let us welcome back Professor Jessica Dator Brasilia, who we have already met earlier after moderating no, the sessions with the local government and community partners. No? Ms. Jack, we thank you very much for co-organizing this event with us. And uh, we, with her presentation entitled Gender Mainstreaming Opportunities and Challenges for Resilience Building, um, yeah. I now hand over the floor to Professor Jessica Dator Brasilia. Yeah. Just yet, uh, we'd like to acknowledge, uh, we have an, indeed, Dr. Emma, we have an international uh, audience here as far as Brazil, you know, so we, ha we have somebody from Brazil joining us. Uh, I'm pretty sure one of your colleagues, and we also have representatives from all over the Philippines, and, um, and uh, we thank them you know, for, for bearing with us. So just a few minutes, and uh, I thought just to give... Um, I, I, there were questions on on, on, on the floor, but um, just to throw one question for uh, to our panelists who would want to answer this: um, what what do you think, or how do you think can we enhance um, gender sensitivity and gender responsiveness in our work on climate and disaster resilience? So, uh, just just uh, perhaps a, a word, you know, a, or a suggestion. Perhaps I can start with uh, Mam Donna. Are you still with us? Ma'am Donna, if not, Mao, any suggestion? Maurice, are you still with us? Um, yes, ma'am, I'm still here. Yeah, uh, so do you have any insights in just one sentence, perhaps, or a couple of, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what do you think? How can we better, still better enhance gender resilience and responsiveness in, in our work on climate and disaster resilience? Um, I'll still keep my uh, uh, my stand that we need to um, give more platform for women in terms of representation in the same decision making. Now. Okay, thank you very much, Mam Donna. Mam Donna. Yes, Mam. Yes, Mam. Sorry. Yes, uh, uh, we, yes. I, I believe that we don't have to do anything grand. I think on continuous discussions, just keeping the information flowing that can keep gender and resilience as a constant conversation among players. So I think that will make an impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ma'am Ann uh, and Ma'am Joyce and uh, Pastor and uh, Ma'am Sylvia, may ari diri nga pamangkot no? from Angie Satake. Uh, and she wants to know, gusto niya mabalaan, kung ano ya ang, of course, you know, um, you have, you have um, let's say, a contribution, you know, from, support agencies like, like from APEC, from the city government. Pero ano yung ang naging counterpart sa community, sa mga babae, uh, kababainhan dira sa, sa komunidad sa langit no? uh, to, enhance self, uh, to enhance resilience and self-reliance. So uh, ano ang uh, personal contribution? Ma'am Ann or uh, Ma'am Joyce, would you want to answer that? Ang mga kababaihan here, Ma'am, we are the one implement okay uh, yes ma'am we are the implementer of the project okay so you you uh put in your time yeah yes ma'am okay and um uh, uh si ma'am sylvia would you want to add anything uh and we are the one who carries the 
the ati to join to work if there is an schedule to work. So every time we have a schedule, we need all the ati to help each other. Okay, so uh, so they are the enablers of the uh, Mam Anji. So they are the enablers of the the community. It might not have um, you know very complete monetary value, but if you look at if we evaluate that, that is a huge contribution for self reliance. You know the investment of women as enablers in this process have not yet been accounted for. You know in our valuation processes. So it. We might think of methodologies for that. So, um, uh, uh, any word, uh, Ma'am Sonia and uh, Boye, and Sir uh, Emmanuel, um, yeah, Arenio, Ma'am Sonia, would yes. you want to start? Yes, Ma'am yeah. Jack. Uh, we we usually demonstrate the the capacities of the federation or the power of the communities, but at times we. Sometimes we are uh, being taken for granted. So that's the the, the I think the, the the question is how can we sustain this kind of partnership with all the stakeholders and at the same time the question of space that was given to the community is always a you know, a challenge. Uh, that's why I would like to thank um, this forum, this webinar, for us to be able to you know constantly remind everyone that communities are not sila pasaway. Hindi sila sa lagurun lang, kundi they still have a stake in the society if given a space and if given a chance to participate. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ma'am Sonia, Sir Boye. And oh. then the last word will be from uh, Doc uh, Gay, if you, you can join us. Yes, uh, Sir Boye. For me, as a civil society organization, it's very important to observe uh, resilient uh, models, no? especially in the local communities no we have to uh, not be afraid of this uh, covid situation because uh, uh, we have to, we can do something because many other ngos are closing down its uh, operations because of the covid and uh, we cannot do it all by webinars alone no we can manage it but uh, we are using uh, observing health and safety protocols no in coordination with the IATF uh, okay. and other agencies. Okay, so uh, work can still continue, you know, for yeah, as long as we... Yeah, can still continue, we, no. Yeah, uh, uh, look as, uh, into the And the, during the time that we have uh, been uh, working on the ground, no, in uh, highly exposed communities, we had not suffered any kind of uh, infection. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sir Boyet. And uh, now, finally, uh, we have uh, Dr. Gay de Fiesta. Are you still on board, Dr. Gay? If she's not already uh, receiving her award. Hi, Ms. Jack. Yes, Dr. Gay. <laughs> they just announced the award. Okay. So anyway. Congratulations, um, Dr. Gay. Yes. Thank you, Mo. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, to, oh, what was the question again? How to mainstream gender, right? No, how how do we ensure that uh, our programs on climate and disaster resilience are more gender sensitive and gender responsive? I think uh, I can only speak as a researcher. Um, being con, I think gender be making my work. Uh, more gender sensitive is having that consciousness that women is part of the picture. So incorporating the analysis, uh, both men and women and all everyone you know, uh, conscious that uh, they are part of the development process. So they must be <coughs> in our research, in our teaching and in our public service. Okay. That's it, that consciousness, thank you. Yeah, uh, and uh, while I'm sharing my screen for the final slides, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of um, Attorney Texan Lim of uh, OCD, uh, OCD's policy team. Uh, uh, Hello, Director Tex. Uh, Director Texan Lim, yeah. thank you for joining us. He's been very busy. but he... Welcome, Director Texan. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, congratulations to everyone. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And and finally, you know, just to um hopefully tie tie things up. Uh where to you know, next? What what's what's the next step for us? And before I turn this over for the final remarks of um of, of Dr. Emma. Um now uh you all know that uh perhaps those in the climate and disaster uh work, you all know that uh intermediate panel on uh, climate uh, 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 change, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, will release uh, AR6 in 2022. But uh, linked up to that, they were already releasing a series of studies that um, that are, are, are making us reflect on what will be the direction of work, you know, and and they will be introducing five set of scenario, five uh, five scenarios, no, uh, uh, for this. And one of those scenarios, as was sh uh, shared to us by uh, one of the IPCC scientists, Dr. Rosa Perez, in a recent international forum, is that they they are looking at a scenario four where you have communities that have are low in mitigation, you know, but the challenges to uh, adaptation. Uh, Will be huge because of inequality, you know, and and I think we're uh, seeing that, you know, in many of um, uh, the developing countries, in many communities, such as that of um, was shared to us, you know, in in uh, Iloilo City. Uh, but let me share with you uh, a, a very recent, uh, you know, study by one of our favorite uh, academicians in the resilience work, Dr. Bernard Maniena. This is a follow through of, of his earlier work, you know, and 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 in examining uh, the the risk drivers uh, to get to where we want to go in terms of resilience, you know, to a space of uh, sustainable development uh, and um, and ensuring that we are able to bounce forward, we need to be able to transform. You know? And uh, in the transformation process, there needs to be a transformation of the status quo. So if you look at the, the risk drivers, you know, which are hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, we, we are looking at in, inequities and inequalities you know, located in the vulnerabilities. You know? And and so the call of our the call towards um uh, uh resilience and adaptation requires us to really build capacities uh, uh transform the status quo and it is here in that we are able to address uh, gender inequities and inequalities. You know? So um I, I wanted to share this slide you know, to remind us um, that even UNFCCC and the highest platforms right now um, of, of the Sustainable Development Goals for, and by the way, there's an Asia Pacific Forum happening right now on this, um, that we will never be able to achieve the goals of um, the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, the goals of Paris Agreement, and the goals of the SDG if we are not able to address inequities and inequalities. And working towards gender responsiveness, working towards uh, 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 gender sensitivity, and achieving targets of gender in development will enable us to meet all these relevant development targets. So thank you very much. I turn you over to Dr. M. Okay. Dr. Emma. Yeah. Hello. Um wow. Say, wow na wow ang trabaho niyo at saka mga ang galing ng mga trabaho niyo. Um Pitong said, women hold half of the sky. Uh Hello Ina. How come I'm not seeing the screen? Hello. Yes, I'm a uh, Anyway, okay. Mao Chitin said, hold half of the sky. But listening to all your stories, I think two thirds, at least, of the Iloilo women, the Ilongas, hold the Iloilo city skies. So congratulations, everyone. You're great collaborative partners for resilience. Thank you all for all the speakers. Thank you for the exciting, dynamic, and, uh, and 
inspiring stories of resilience, equity, and sustainability from the ground up in Iloilo, especially from those the communities, uh, the NGOs, the CSOs, the LGUs, and the academic partners. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I enumerated their names, but no more because we are running out of time. So as I listen to you, the words of Kofi Annan reverberate in my head. Gender equality is a precondition for meeting the challenges of reducing poverty and promoting sustainability and good governance. So let me um, outline to you two lines, which I think is very relevant to these issues of equity, sustainability, and governance. As you can hear from the IPCC, they are saying now that the major crisis now is the climate crisis and the crisis of inequality, gender equality, ethnic inequality, uh, class inequality, and right. As we progress, as our cities progress, if we do not narrow the gap between those who have and those who have not, then our sustainability is very much challenged, and so is our equity. So, I must say that you know uh, your uns uh, the stories this morning really inspired me. And I was just looking at all your stories. I was thinking, all, all the works from the CSOs, academe, and uh, the, the government really advance what I call a risk-informed and a resilience-driven initiative. Because in, in SICAR and in RC, we always say that to reduce vulnerability, you have to measure first. Their, ex their exposure and vulnerability to the hazards. And then you can pinpoint what are the key points that you should do in order to reduce the vulnerability and increase the resilience. So I would like to say that uh, I was listening to your story. I was reminded of the Buddhist uh, the Balinese god Sawasati. Sawasati had eight hands and therefore she can do so many things. And I was thinking, listening to all these women here, I was thinking, I think they have 10 hands to be able to do the work at home, do the volunteer work in the community, do the work in the real work, in, the, uh, in, their, um, in their work in offices and the like. So um, let me bring these issues to what NRC is trying to do in terms of developing an LG resilient program. An LGU that is able to basically bounce forward better, be able to prepare and assess and adapt and transform. Let me say basically that there are two points that I'd like to point out. To advance the LGU resilient program in Iloilo, number one, gender equality or equity, we must reduce the inequality between the genders, between the uh, Ethnic, ethnic groups and the, between those who are of the better off and the lower the lower off. So I, w I was looking at gays uh, tables and I was thinking, how must we, you know, with our program, with our policies, programs in our LC Cup, in our club, in our in annual investment uh, plan and in our PPAs, how can we reduce these vulnerabilities of those women in these different places? As a sociologist, I always say, vulnerability is socially and spatially differentiated. It's also politically and economically differentiated. So we must connect the inputs, the inputs from the local governments, the inputs from the private sector, the inputs from, or the initiatives from the civil society and community-based organizations taken together in order that they can really promote towards, uh, you know, um, as I was looking at your um, initiatives, I was thinking, oh my God, you know, they're doing all this, you know, um, re in reducing the vulnerability to flooding, to water insecurity, to food insecurity, and really promoting the stability of the income and livelihood basis of the vulnerable groups. I, I saw that in all of your initiatives, you got them all. So I will, in closing, I'd like to say that number two, equity and, and sustainability also 
necessitate uh, the good governance condition that we want. Uh, we basically, as presented earlier by Tony Yolo Loisaga, uh, there's the resilience scorecards that hopefully support and guide the, the construction of the LGO resilient city or the really resilient program. So including we at the CICAR page and in partnership with ADMO, Manila Observatory, the National Resilience Council with UPV and local government of Iloilo, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you for traveling together with us. We want to, I would like to urge everyone that as we move forward and travel together, we hold our hands and support with our spirit, with all the other non-spirit, um, other material things. And we really must move forward in a collaborative and innovative way to sustain your highly successful CCADR initiatives that promotes resilience. And I would like to thank again all the speakers, all the uh, members of the panelists this morning, because I think we have really the basic conditions towards an LGU resilient program in Iloilo City. And we can basically say that women and men hold both the sky together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc Emma. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to all our attendees, to our panelists. We truly appreciate um, your support today. And we would appreciate your feedback from today's proceedings for the webinar. So please send in your comments through our evaluation form at the top ly slash gender dash epa. So we hope to see you again in our next webinar happening on March 31, Gender, Environment, and Housing Resilience featuring speakers Dr. Anna Marie Caraos and Professor Mary Anna Pampo. So we'll be hearing responses from the district representative, um, Diego Benitez, attorney Juniper Payot, Ms. Jessica Soto, and Ms. Anna Ignacio. So register now at bit.ly slash ghr register. So thank you all and may you have a great week ahead. Would you like to take a photo, Ina? Yes, all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. All the people who are here with us. And thank you very much, Eloilo, Jack, and everyone from UPV, from the LGU, from the ILG, everyone from the community and the CSOs. Sonia, uh, I didn't forget. I, you know, I wanted to min mention every name Sonia, Donna, Franco, Cindy, Joy, <laughs> Dr. Monique, um, Natalie, and all. But you didn't have time anymore, but know that this is not the last one, how we will see each other again in May, hopefully. We want to really focus on the private sector and its contribution and how we can partner more effectively together with the community, as Natalie said, with the community, with the LGU, with the regional offices and all other sectors. Thank okay. you. Can we- Ina, can you take the photo? Please? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, it's okay. Big smiles, one, two, three, smile. Another one. One, two, three, smile. Oh, Lenny. Okay, so yeah, one last. One, two, three, smile. So yeah, I think we've got it. Thank uh, you so you. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for making Thank Women's so Month much. a great one with Iloilo stories. Thank you, Mom, Emma. Thank you, Thank you very much.